Yes, so uh, Prabhu sir is already here. Uh, so Professor Prabhu is basically the person behind uh, a lot of the courses that you have, the modules that you attended on Yaks, as well as the platform itself. Uh, I won't take up much time. Uh, I'll I'll let him uh, take over and and interact with you folks. Uh, all yours, sir. Bye, everyone. This is Prabhu here. So I hope you have been enjoying the course so far. So much, sir. So much. Oh, very good. Yes, sir. Very glad. Yes, sir. So right. it started with your lecture, sir, on the yaks. Yeah, so that hopefully that was yeah. the boring part. But I, I think the, uh, I mean, your Django trainers are very experienced. So you should, you. you should definitely ask them all the questions that you have. Sir, you are also explaining all the things very comfortably. I mean, what easily समझ में आती हैं without any. Oh, glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. I have already learned my advanced Python, but still I got to know many new things from your videos. So ah, okay. it was nice experience. Very good. Thank you so much. So my purpose here is not to do anything technical, uh, but okay. First, thank you very much for your very kind comments. Um, um, just I just wanted to say hello to everyone and answer any you know general questions, not necessarily. um you know django specific because i think that uh, the actual django experts here are uh, you know ankit and prathamesh and others uh, i don't know if aditya is also teaching but they are all django experts as in they use it day to day so they are very good at that so i will not field any questions about django per se uh, but if you have general questions on python or um Uh, yes, sir, for somebody who is only fifteen days old in Python, and then this uh, uh, workshop occurred. What are the ways in which we can advance our knowledge? Uh, sorry, so let me rephrase the question just to make sure that I understood your question. Um, you are asking if you are only fifteen days into Python, how can you learn more? Is that correct? Yes, because there are so. It's just like you are in crossing, and there are so many ways. There's yeah, Django, it is a little learning. daunting. It is a little scary because. there are so many things to learn so many libraries and every day there are new libraries yes so that is a little uh, don't so yes we want to know ki what is the exact path which we follow to learn python gracefully okay yeah that's a very good question so um, my see my own entry into the into python and human programming is more from an application point of view that is i needed to do uh, scientific computing and i like programming a little bit so or quite a bit so i got into it that way so my suggestion honestly is that you find something to do with the language because it is just like any other uh, to some extent it is like any other language you know even if you say let's say you want to learn um uh, you know bengali or something right and if you don't have any bengali friends you don't read bengali literature you don't see bengali comics or you don't read you don't see bengali movies or bengali songs there is very little chance for you to you know really grow in the language so the best way is to you know interact with people uh, in the language sense so in in computer programming the best way is to really try to do something with the language so now that you have learned the basics maybe pick a task uh, now depending on what your background is you may or may not have time uh, so if you have the time if you spend you know maybe every week you spend an hour or two hours trying to work on some project that you want to do uh, usually that's a really good starting point and that's how even i start you know i was trying to do something and then you know i just got caught up in it and then i was like oh i can do it like this and then try to see how you can do it better and you will then realize that you know it's it's the nice thing about these open source programming languages is you can learn it by yourself largely once you get started and you have the overall ideas uh, you can learn it by yourself you can learn more by yourself uh, and a lot of information is available online the problem though is even if you start with uh, if you start with nothing no clarity it's too many things right there are hundreds and thousands of libraries so you won't know where to start so honestly my suggestion is 
you know something um, you want to do something specific and you want to you know use python for that start doing something that you would like and again you don't need to ask somebody else for a project you will always have your own you know things that you want to do so for example you want to build a small website with somebody somebody can log in then you can use django if you want to say no i want to do some scientific computing then you can learn scientific computing specific tools um, if you want to do some data analysis then you can learn up learn you know data analysis specific tools but the instant you do that then you are motivated so and then you can keep it as a small weekly task or something like that that you spend say okay saturday afternoon let's say you are free you can just spend couple of hours and say okay i want to like work on my project you will have fun because it's your project it's not somebody else's project you know and uh, you learn because you probably won't know all the libraries so you search uh, you may need a starting point as to what to use you know what libraries to use or something like that but usually the best choices are also kind of well known so if you say look i want to do data analysis in python you'll find 30 articles about it. and you pick some article and say hey this library is great somebody will say oh, okay fine you check it out read it and then you try those things then you go read more about the library this is the best way in my honest opinion to learn because unlike you know something like a theory subject um you know it's really what you do that drives this rather than um, see it's not like mathematics or something where you know you need to work a lot to understand a huge amount of basics and then you can start doing research or you know do some interesting things um here it is like you it's a, the language is typically fairly simple and then it's the ecosystem around that language that takes some time learning uh, So that's my advice. Sir, so, uh, but आपके according basic libraries कौन सी हैं जिनका knowledge मतलब आज की date में भी कोई भी अपने आप को Python expert नहीं बोल सकता. हाँ नहीं बोल नहीं सकते हैं वो सही है. तो basic libraries कौन सी हैं जो पता होनी ही चाहिए अगर आप Python developer या Python faculty. So is even in this na. So I will answer in. If you don't mind, I'll answer in English simply because I don't know if everybody here is comfortable with Hindi. I can answer in Hindi. My Hindi is not great, but I can still. I don't mind speaking. No, no sir. Yeah, English. But if there's somebody from say Tamil Nadu or somebody like that, I don't want them to feel left out. Is it okay if I answer in Hindi, everyone? So somebody. Oh, have... sir, can you speak in English? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. fine. I'll keep it in English just so that everybody gets it. Uh, it's unfortunate that we need to speak in a foreign language so everybody can understand, but it's okay. Um, see, the, the this is again the same thing, you know. If uh, because the number of libraries is so large, I can't say there is like a baseline set. So supposing you're coming, you're coming at this purely from a web development perspective, then in fact you don't need to know NumPy, you don't need Pandas, you don't need this, that, the other. There you'll need to learn requests, you'll need to learn, you know. uh web apis how do you write you know a rest based uh, api you may need to look at uh, flask or bottle or you know then look at tango of course but so there are so it depends on what area you want to focus on and you will find this very commonly in the python environment itself you will find somebody who is an expert in django but they won't know something else in some other domain like you may ask me something i know a lot about something in say in one area in say scientific computing with python But you ask me something else in Python, I may not know. So mm. uh, it is the same thing here. So you need to first pick what you are interested in. Then the basic libraries can be set. You know, you can tell you what it is. So if you say data analysis, I would suggest start with pandas, right? Mm. If it's web development, you need to understand something about web APIs. It helps to have a lower level understanding of the basic protocols. What is the HTTP protocol? How does it work? How does a website work? You understand that and say, okay, fine. Maybe how does security work? All of this. Then what is a you know what is django where in this entire web development area does django fit for example there's client side there's server side so client side is very different then it's not even python well now it's changing but yes dominant thing now is python yeah, sorry is javascript in the web uh, front end side but even that there are options now st slowly starting to come up in python as well so so it really depends on the area so if you give me a specific area i can give you some answers if i know them if i don't we oh. will ask somebody else uh, yes. like data analytics sir. data analytics so data analytics uh, my suggestions would be pandas would definitely be the first piece you need to learn how to use pandas you learn how to use pandas well there's lot of documentation there lots of tutorials online you may even find tutorial videos uh, so for example if you go to scipy if you go to youtube there's a scipy channel where they have like a 4 hour tutorial on pandas somebody would have done it 
So you need to know NumPy also if you want to do pandas. So know, learn how to use NumPy well. Learn pandas. Um, then you can learn matplotlib slash cborn for plotting, whatever it is that you would like. There are a whole bunch of plotting utilities. So that's an whole universe by itself. But pandas itself will expose some set of uh, plotting UIs. So that's like a very good starting point. If you're really good at pandas, you can do a lot of stuff. But then there's the other angle of data analysis is statistics. And that has two components. So you need to learn like decent amount of statistics from the math side and understand you know, data analysis from that point of view. And then depending on whether you're doing frequentist or Bayesian, you can choose, you know, uh, SciPy has some things that you can do for uh, some frequentist approaches. But if you want to look at Bayesian, there is something called PyMC4 or PyMC3, which does, you know, uh, MCMC sampling for uh, Bayesian analysis. There are a bunch of Bayesian related tools. There are even good books that you can find free on them. So it really depends again. There also it depends on which what, which kind of area you're trying to specialize in. Uh, there are also some good books if you want to do data analysis. There's a so, nice book by uh, Alan Downey. Okay, thank you. Uh, he has a book on Think Python. He also has uh, Think, St Think Stats. It's a really nice book. He also has a book on Think Bayes, which is Bayesian statistics with Python. But he doesn't use the libraries. He focuses more on the basic concepts. So you can learn things from there. So again, if you want to really get good at something, you need to read a lot and do a lot. So, you know, that's what it takes. So that's the reason I'm suggesting you find something that's of interest to you and you spend time on that. That's the best way because then you have the motivation. Otherwise, if somebody says, look, you have to spend, you know, 100, 200 hours before you get to become an expert. It's like a lot of work. That is very interested in the area. It makes it easy. Sir, area is com complex ho na because Python has a use in today's rate. Mein. Yeah. Ja use ho hai. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so there's Thank a lot. So much, it, was there another question you asked or was that? Uh, sir, I have, a, I have a question, sir. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in uh, web development and uh, I have just finished out with the Node.js and okay. jQuery. Uh, but I'm uh, dynamic programming in uh, web development. So, sir, uh, with Django, uh, what are the other things that I need to uh, learn so uh, I'm, ca I'm capable of uh, of becoming a dynamic uh, dynamic web developer. I don't know what you mean by dynamic web developer. I mean, you, you mean to say a very good developer. Is that web uh, developer? Means basically, sir, like uh, uh, so news, uh, news, news portals, uh, basically changing uh, on the day to day basis on our yeah. our. So I think Django was initially built for some news kind of platforms. It was. Yeah, so Django is definitely something you can you need to learn. But I mean, this is just a workshop that gets you started. So what you need to do is do more, learn more, read all the documentation, see if you can find a tutorial online as well. Read that. There's also books on Django. Okay, uh, so you can pick up a book and learn that as well. So they'll typically do a project in a book. They'll take a large -ish project and explain various uh, aspects. Now, if you're building a large-ish website, you may have other kind of things to worry about as well. So if you're looking at DevOps, how do you how do you make a website that's going to scale? That's like an entirely different set of tools and infrastructure. And nothing to do with Python. I mean, then you may find Python-based tools somewhere there, but that's not Python, that's DevOps. So that's a separate site. If you're doing front-end, then you need to learn master JavaScript whatever front end you're going to work on, each of them is like a separate universe of its own. How do you write good tests, good quality code? Um, yeah, and then, so basically it's, you know, it's a constant drive by yourself to do more. I don't know if there's something. Ankit, do you think there's something else that needs to be learned? Oh, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if by dynamic web development, maybe the person who's talking about these more snazzier, front end driven websites yeah so, so those will be heavily you know then you'll have to learn some framework like you know i don't know Vue okay. or react or you know whatever new fashion there is in javascript today you will have to learn those and then learn a lot of you know good css as well yes SAS. yeah sas or less or whatever new flavor there is today so yeah yes. so i am a I'm a student of artificial intelligence background. 
Um, I'm personally interested in astronomy and cosmology. So could you suggest something like which language I should go with and what are the different courses which I can do? Uh, so astronomy and what is the other cosmology? Cosmology. Yeah, so again, these are very vast fields. Uh, I don't do astronomy, cosmology myself, but I know that astronomers in Python at least use this package called AstroPy. It's used by a lot of the large labs um, because it has a support for a wide variety of astrophysics related image files and things like that. Um, so in it really depends again on what you're looking at, but say, for example, if you're doing optical astronomy, you know, your large aspect of it is doing a lot of image processing. So you can enter through image processing if one, that's one particular way of doing it. Uh, if you're looking at cosmology, you know, there's again the physics side of it, which is, you know, you can either do the theory side of it or the experimental side of it. In which case, you know, it really depends on what you're doing. Uh, and also like being an artificial intelligence student like uh, we have different languages but which is the uh, language which is preferred right. well uh, i would be i'm biased and i would say you know python's a good pick but there are many right so there's like uh, there are lots of programming languages that support um ml and ai but yeah python is among the strongest there's also Julia, which has a good AI story for sure. Um, but yeah, the most of the most popular libraries are in Python. You know, there's TensorFlow, there is uh, PyTorch, of course, um, right? And then there's, I think, MXNet. There are many libraries, but the dominant two, for example, TensorFlow and PyTorch, uh, they're Python based. So Python will help you there. So see, the thing here is even with programming languages, Whatever one you learn, you need to be able to do a lot with it and you need to learn it well. That's the first thing, right? So supposing you're good at C++, you can do a lot, especially now because C++ is a much better C++11 and all this cleaned up a lot of things, but still it's a harder programming language. Um, and so, you know, doing things like interactive development, quickly making plots, you, you know, analysis of that kind is much easier in something like that. Uh, but you know, if you have your strength is C++ and you like C++, you can still do things there. But usually most people who work at that level work at one level lower uh, than Python. So you're typically building the building blocks and then people will build on top of that. Now, if you're doing cosmology and you're trying to do computational cosmology, then you have to deal with high performance codes, which is another, that's another separate universe. Um, and there again, it depends on at what level you're planning. If you're going to use existing libraries, you don't need to know all the low level tools. But if you want to use the low level tools and extend them, then you need to learn the low level tools as well. Um, but there's a lot that you can do with just Python and at the high level. So Python, NumPy, SciPy, um, Scikit image is for image processing. So you can do that. Um, if you want high performance, you can use something like Numba for performance. But yeah, so there's a there's a whole host of these tools, but they are good starting points. And then AstroPy, if you're specifically interested in astronomy and things like that. Thank you. I believe there are some courses. I don't know Udemy or somewhere else. A colleague of mine was trying something. He was taking a course on astronomy with Python and stuff. I'm sure there'll be courses online, but I think you can find them out on your own. So if you find something interesting, take it. Sure. Okay. Um, so, uh, Ankit, there are several questions on the chat, which I have not seen. Should I go through them? Yeah. Okay, fine. So, uh, I'll start. I'll try to answer a few. Huh. So maybe you can tell me if you have answered something. So I'm unable, I'm unable to optimize code. Can you give some tips regarding it? So it depends on what, uh, code you want to optimize. If you want to write something better in Python and you want to stick to pure Python, then you need to understand you know, at least data structures and algorithms. Very often, you know, we write code that is not cognizant of our data structures. So for example, if you, if you're trying to search through a list, for example, so if you're trying, you have elements, you have say a lot of fruits that you've stored in a list, 
object and you're going to so search saying okay find if something exists in this and let's say you're doing that n times that's going to be horribly slow because search through a list is an order of n operation it's not a mm -hmm. constant time operation so you need to be aware of some of these um on the other hand if you wanted to speed that up you would use a dictionary or a set because there it's you know it's a key map based it's a hash map so it's much faster so it's constant time access so it really depends on you know uh, what the task is and then having a reasonable understanding of the basic data structures in the, that the language provides and how well the language performs. And one trick that a lot of people who try to get performant code do is they will write small snippets and you can use the time it macro that like, I don't know if it was done in the course lectures here, but there's a IPython macro called, uh, called magic function called percentage time it. So you can just give it a single statement and it'll execute that statement n times and then tell you how fast it is. So there's a good way to get a sense of, oh, you know, oh, this thing is a little fast. This is slow. This is how it works. And then you start digging deeper into Python's implementation, read online. You'll learn a little more about optimization at the Python level. If you want to now go to a level lower, so let's say you have numeric code, like code that uses NumPy and things like that. A good starting point would be something like number, where you just do a decorator, make sure you're only, uh, you know, uh, you're only manipulating NumPy arrays. You're not creating new objects or things like that in a function. And you can have NumPy do the optimization. It'll basically convert that code uh, into something that can, it, it basically directly converts it into uh, uh, LLVM IR. So basically into a low level code or machine code automatically for you. And that is executed on the CPU. So you can use tools like that to speed it up. And if that's not enough, you can now go one level lower. You can implement it in C or C++ or Fortran or um, yeah, or, or say CUDA or OpenCL or whatever. And then you can wrap that to Python. And there are also lots of tools to do that relatively easily from the Python, uh, from the Python layer. So it really depends on where you're trying to optimize what. The only thing that you should be very careful about is don't unnecessarily optimize things that don't need to be optimized. So first thing you need to do is profile your code. Make sure you, you're paying attention to the actual code that is taking the time most of the time. Um, so use a profiler. Um, there is a good profiler, uh, Scalene, S-C-A-L-E-N-E. -E. It's a nice profiler. So you can use Scalene, um, you know, to do your uh, profiling. And then once you find out what are the functions that are slow or fast, you know, you can uh, optimize all the slow functions, uh, both at the Python level or at the C level. So that is a suggestion. One second. Uh, I noticed a question that sort of uh, could resonate with you is Manish Narnavre asks, what are what is a good book yeah, to teach Python okay. to a novice? Uh, yeah. So I will. Yeah, I'll I'll try and answer that. Uh, so what's a good book to teach Python to a novice? Okay. So so if you're if maybe you're what right, is a good resource is more general. Yeah. So there are several books. Um, None of them are, some of them I don't quite, they're all at different levels. So if, it depends on your audience. If you have students who are primarily from an engineering, non-CS background, what they require is slightly different. If you have folks from a CS background, they have really no choice, you know, so you can do the standard approach of teaching, which most textbooks take. Um, so Alan Downey's Think Python is a good book. Uh, there is a nice book if you have more science -y bent you know, I want to do interesting things with uh, scientific computing, uh, sort of, at a high level. There is uh, Professor uh, Dr. Ajit Kumar's uh, book. Um, it's available freely online on, online on his xpies.in website. I think, Ankit, you can share a link. He has a PDF yeah. of a book that he has written, and that's freely available. Uh, I, If you have a background on already no pro basic programming, the way I started learning Python is through the Python tutorial. It's actually very well written. Um, so that's a nice, you know, it's a, it's a tutorial. So you can just go through it and it'll sort of walk you through the various features of the language. So if you're already a programmer, it's easy. Uh, but if they are a novice as in complete novice to programming in general, yeah, then, you know, some of the other books like, you know, Think Python, uh, those are all, uh, you know, better books to teach. Uh, yeah. So usually when I've been teaching Python, I, I don't quite refer to a book. I kind of teach it. So I have not kind of used a book. Um, I've been working on a book myself, 
but it's not finished yet. So I will make that available when that when that happens. So, um, but yeah, that's those are books. Any other books? Uh, there used to be a book called um, Dive into Python, which I read many many years ago, which is nice. But again, that is not necessarily for beginners. Um, I think Swaroop had written a nice book long back, but I've you know I don't know. Uh, I, I really don't know what is the best book for someone to learn. Uh, my uh, my suggestion is you look at a bunch of books. You know, most of them you'll find at least table of contents or at least the blurb or a chapter or sample chapter. Uh, find the book that talks to you the most and go with it. At least this is what I'm finding with a lot of even other subjects. Uh, different books appeal to different people based on their personality or you know what they like. So you know. There's no harm picking more books than one. Okay. Uh, next question. How much time will it take to master Python? I don't know. Infinite time. <laughs> you never master it. You know? It's a language. It's like everything else. You're always learning. And the language is also evolving. It's not a fixed thing that you master and you attain something and you're done. And the same way, once you attain it, it's not like it always stays with you. right? So, for example, if I don't program for two years in Python, I will forget all my Python. I may remember how to think about writing a good program, but I may not remember the actual syntax and I may not remember all the libraries. Like even now, I can't remember which book. Somebody asked me a book. I'm like, I have to recall names, scaling. You know, I don't I forget. So this happens. Um, yeah, and then you have also suggested a nice book, Automate Boring Stuff with Python. Yeah, okay, fine. Okay, ML and AI, can you suggest some resources and modules? Yeah, so there's lots of tons of resources and modules already, right? So, for example, PyTorch has some really nice tutorials. So if you're already familiar, those tutorials are great. I started learning PyTorch by just reading that tutorials. So it's uh, those are nice resources. Um, the Scikit-Learn as well. Scikit-Learn documentation is excellent. So you can learn, uh, Scikit-Learn has really good docs. So you can start there. Um, and in fact, you may find very good tutorials online on Scikit-Learn. Um, and in fact, every year at SciPy US, there is a tutorial or two, usually one or two tutorials, like four-hour tutorials on machine learning. Some some particular, like it could be Scikit-Learn, could be PyTorch, whatever. Okay, more questions. Aha, somebody's asked a difficult question, a direct message. What should I learn if I am interested in Android development or mobile development? Yeah, so that's a hard one. That's a hard one because there are not many, many good tools in Python for this. There are. There is something called Kiwi and there's an Android for Python, but none of them is like writing it natively with Java and the, you know, Android development kit and stuff, uh, or even Kotlin or other programming languages, which are kind of designed for the mobile space. Things are changing now though. So if you want to build something that's heavily front-end driven, so something based on a browser, uh, you can do that because uh, it is starting to change because you can actually write front-end related stuff with Python. It's a little heavy because you have to have a Python runtime, um, but it has been done and it's not very hard to do. Uh, but yes, that is a space which is kind of not very strong. With Python. So Android development, I would say that, you know, Python is not a very strong story. There's something called, I think, Something called beware or something like that. One second. Uh, yes. B -W -E yeah. Okay. I keep forgetting these names. Okay. So beware is a thing which allows you to write it in Python, but I don't know. I've not used it or I checked it out several years ago. Um, but oh, there's some status update as of August. And they do have something. All right. So you can check it out. There are some projects, but not too many. Kiwi is another one, K-I-V-Y. Uh, Kiwi Python, uh, and then you can see there may be cross-platform Python for NUI development, so native UI development. So yeah, so there are some of these, and Kiwi Python framework for mobile development also you can check out. So some of these, but and there's also Android for Python, but some of them are not, as I said before, not the same scale or not the same, you know, ease or at this anywhere near the level of maturity that standard Android SDK is. At. Um, how does R compare to Python on data science works? Okay, so this is a 
I don't know if it's a bait <laughs> question. Uh, so I'll be a little careful. So firstly, R is really fantastic for statistics. Uh, the kind of libraries and statistical packages you will have access to in R is something that you will not get direct access to in Python. However, there is an R Python bridge, which means if you have an R runtime, you can load that into Python and vice versa. You can do stuff from R in Python to some extent. So that is one way to sort of bridge the two. Um, but if you ask me personally for my kind of uh, work, I think as a language, Python is a nicer language. It's easier to understand. It's easier to reason about Python like a, as a computer scientist would look at it. Um, R code is kind of more magic -y. That is, you know, you do something and it's like, how does this work? You know, it's like kind of magic sometimes. Um, at least for me, I don't know R very well though. So I I should be careful when saying that. But I think as a language, Python is a stronger language. It feels more natural to me. Um, and Python is a lot more general purpose than R in the sense that I don't know if there are any web frameworks written in R. And I don't think there are too many of them. But R is really good at a very specific niche. So supposing you want to build an app which does a bunch of data analysis and statistics and you want to share that online, R has an entire ecosystem for this. It has shiny apps. And the nice thing with R is there's only kind of, there'll only be one or two tools at best. You know, there's, there's Knitter or something like that in R. Um, but shiny is like one and only. Whereas in Python for the same thing, you want to put, uh, you know, a little data processing app online and you want to share it with a UI and stuff, there'll be four or five different solutions. So this is both an advantage and a disadvantage. So there's one thing called panel. There is um, um, Plotly has its own thing. Then, you know, there's a bunch of these players, you know, in Python, the star streamlit. There are like a lot of these little packages which allow you to sort of put up a, uh, an app with a sort of dashboard or something like that, where you can pull a slider and it'll do something, you can upload a data set. Um, so this is again the same kind of thing. Python is so incredibly popular that you find lots and lots of things. Uh, but in certain niche areas, um, uh, especially so if you're looking at statistics, R is like very hard to beat because R has an extensive set of packages and a huge community of people who build projects under R. So that kind of thing. So if it's very specialized, then you'll probably have to get into R. But if you're writing a general purpose thing, then I would suggest Python. So it really depends again who you are and what you're trying to do. Um, but if you're just doing statistics for the sake of statistics and you're not a programmer, you're looking at just stats, um, you want to just say, okay, I want a library's access to the latest statistical packages, I would suggest try R, uh, use R. But if you're like uncomfortable with the language, you're more comfortable with the Python's uh, way of doing things, then think about an R to Python bridge so you can use some of the R tools in Python. Uh, in the past, this was very bad. There was a big difference between R and Python, but gap is going closer and closer as in Python is getting better and better, closer and closer. Like pandas is like R's uh, data frame. Pandas data frame is like very similar to that. But the thing is now it's not just pandas. There's also X-ray, you know, there's uh, Dask. Now there are a bunch of tools in Python which, you know, go beyond pandas. So um, yeah, that's the nice thing about Python. There are lots and lots of things. Can we take one last question and then I can, I'm trying to sort of do a hostile yes. takeover because Yes, we need to sorry. complete a bit of yeah i'm going to skip the go land question because i it has i don't python is not yeah you can you can skip the opinionated questions <laughs> if you want to would we see ai and cloud computing in coming years i have no idea okay cloud computing is here to stay but ai is there's a lot of hype around it so be careful uh so that's uh, best book resource post on dsa what is dsa i don't know what dsa is data structures and algorithms oh okay yeah then you have to pick a classic read a nice you know uh, the classic textbooks on uh, you know data structures and algorithms right there's a book by goldwasser and goodrich and all that data structures and algorithms in python but you know i would suggest you pick a book good data structures and algorithms book um in and of itself and then you know go from there there are a whole bunch 
right so there's one by you know i think what drivers no so who's what's the most popular um, data structures book i forget now the title of that also no there are too many books that show up for me right now okay yeah you can pick a standard cs reference text yeah, there are lots of them look at the algorithms so that's what i would suggest okay uh so there are ml and ai can you conduct such workshops and training sessions okay that's good feedback uh any other questions uh ankit that i missed um no uh, most are in the same vein so like data structures and algorithms uh, how to yeah, use so, python for data x data structures and algorithms so it really depends you know so if you're looking at it from the low level you don't even need a programming language right if you're trying to understand data structures and algorithms in abstract you don't need a programming language but if you really want to apply it to a specific programming language yeah you can always use any language you know python is easy to write so use it in python but the problem is some things are like why would you write this in python somebody's already written you know a dictionary or a hash map you don't need to write it again so if you really want to say no i want to like weight lifting they say you want to torture yourself writing algorithms yeah you should do it you can write it in any language you can write it in python you can write it in c c++ um somebody's asked python for image analysis yeah it has pretty good tools open cv is accessible through python and sikit image is also very good so i would suggest sikit image s c i k i t hyphen image uh, security i am sorry i don't know how do you use it in security said there are some people who talk about it but again i think they are cross cutting you know it's not like there is nothing specific security wise that python or c++ or something else is better suited for if you want to learn it okay python for ar vr yeah good question there are tools for doing visualization uh, and graphics in python but ar vr really depends on the hardware as well so yeah i don't know if sdks per se but so apple has its own set of stuff android will have its own set of stuff something cross platform for that domain i'm not familiar with so i've not checked i need to i need to look up that i don't know python for use in earth science the same as any other engineering discipline so yes a lot of people use python for earth science it is geophysics uh, geomechanics yeah you can use it there okay i think i've answered as much as i can in the short time i know i have not answered everything some of which i don't have the answers for so no problem uh thank you for thank you for joining in sir uh, i understand that there will always be questions so in professor's absence i guess we can try and answer them later if you want to but generally uh python for x or python for y uh, is something that you can always get hold of on the internet usually uh, a lot of resources these days uh so professor prabhu thank you for joining in uh i hope you could answer most of your questions yeah thank you very much uh, nice to see you all um, wish you all the best and hope you enjoy the rest of the workshop and hope to see you again in future workshops so thank you so bye. much bye. thank you sir thank you bye thank you everyone